Ever wondered what it takes to become an ethical hacker? A major key lies in mastering a skill that empowers you like no other. L L Linux. Linux is an operating system. Just like Windows. But with a crucial distinction, it's open source. source. Being open source means that its source code is accessible and modifiable by anyone. Which is why if you search for Linux distributions on Google, you'll come across various versions of Linux customized by different developers. But why learn Linux to get into cybersecurity? What makes it so important for your journey? Well for one, many lab environments used for hands-on training are built on top of Linux, and so knowing how it works is essential for navigating or testing those systems effectively. Furthermore, as an aspiring hacker, whenever you'll search for a tutorial related to cybersecurity on the internet, you'll likely come across a video or article featuring Linux. That's why in this video, we're gonna cover everything you need to know to get started with Linux, whether that be terminal basics to user management, or understanding the Linux file system to exploring what the sudo command really means. So let's get started. Disclaimer. This video is for educational purposes only. It teaches Linux basics in the context of cybersecurity training using simulated environments, and does not promote or demonstrate any illegal activities. Okay so what exactly is the Linux terminal, and what does Linux commands even mean? Well before I get into that, if you don't have a Linux distribution already up and running, I'd recommend you pausing this video, and checking out this short guide I put together on how to download and install Kali Linux, a Linux distribution used in cybersecurity for safe and legal practices by clicking on the link in the description down below. Anyways coming back to the topic, you see, many Linux distributions, specifically Kali Linux, is GUI, which means that it has some attractive icons, a dock, menus, and other stuff. And you can use Linux through these things, but for someone looking to get into cybersecurity, it isn't meant to be used like this. The true power of Linux is that you don't use GUI, you use the Linux terminal, also known as the command line, and the Linux terminal is this thing right here, so go ahead and click on that. So this is the terminal, and you are supposed to use Linux through it. Now to better understand how the terminal interacts with the system, what I want you to do is open up your terminal window like this, and also position this home directory right next to it. So we'll learn our first commands by doing something here in the GUI, and then doing the exact same thing here in the terminal. Now the first big difference between the GUI and the terminal is that we always know where we are, like right now I'm in my user directory, because I can see it right here. But over here in the terminal, it's just a black box, so how do I know where I am? Well that's exactly what we're going to figure out with our first command pwd. pwd stands for print working directory, and it basically shows us where we're at. So let's try it out, go ahead and hit enter, and as you can see, it displayed the full path of where we are right now, the home directory, and then inside that is our user directory, meaning that right now, we are in the same spot as our GUI. Now you might be wondering, it's great to know where we are, but we still don't see the same stuff in the terminal as within the GUI, like folders of desktop downloads and other stuff. Well this is where our next command ls comes in. ls stands for list, and all it does is it shows what's inside the directory we're currently working in. So let's go ahead and hit enter. And there it is, everything we could see in the GUI, we can now also see in the terminal. Now let's say, what if we need to take a look inside our desktop folder right here. For GUI, we can just double click to open it, but how can we do that in the terminal? Well that's where another command cd comes in. cd stands for change directory, and it's used to move from one folder to another. So let's do that right now. Now, after cd, I'll hit space, and then tell it what directory I want to go to, so let's type in desktop, and hit enter. And as you can see, we are indeed in the desktop folder, as the location between these brackets changed to it. Now to see what is in this desktop folder, just like we can see here in GUI, we can simply use the ls command once again. But now how can we go back, like in the GUI here, we can just click on the back button, and go to the directory we were initially in. So how do we do this in the terminal? Well it's actually pretty simple, so again we are going to use cd, but this time, put in two dots here. And upon hitting enter, cd dot will take us back to our previous directory. Now coming back to our desktop directory, how can we remove or delete something? Like here in the GUI, if I want to remove this file, I can simply right click on it and select delete to delete it. So how do we do that here in the terminal? Well that's where our next command rm comes in. rm stands for remove, and as the name suggests, it can remove a file in our current working directory. To use it, just type in rm followed by a space, and insert the name of the file you want to remove. And upon hitting enter, you can see that the file we had on the desktop folder is now gone. Next, you can also create a folder in the current working directory, using the mkdir command. To use it, type in mkdir followed by a space, and then type in a name that you would like to give to your new folder. And as you can see, it created a folder right here on the desktop for us. But now if we try to remove it with the rm command, it gives us an error, so why is that? Well that's because it's a folder, not a file, and to remove a folder, we also need to add a dash r switch after typing in the rm command like this. Finally, we have the man or the man command. What this command does is it displays the user manual of any command that we can run on the terminal. So for example if I type in man, and then type rm followed by a space, it will tell us what this command does and how can we use it. This is a pretty cool and useful command for beginners. 
Chapter number two, the Linux file system. Okay, so far in the video, we've learned a few basic commands like ls, which lists all the things in our current working directory, the cd command, which changes our current directory to somewhere else, the pwd command which will tell us where we are, and we even saw that, if we type in cd dot dot, it will take us back to where we were. But I wonder where will we end up, if we keep going back in the terminal. Let's find out, cd dot dot. Okay, so we are now in the home directory. Let's try cd dot dot once again, and now we are in this forward slash directory. Now if we try to go back once again, you'll notice that we're still in this forward slash directory so why is that well that's because we have reached the end so what is this forward slash and what does it mean well this slash symbolizes the root of the file system which essentially is the heart of linux because everything needed for it to work is stored here now as an ethical hacker or a cybersecurity student understanding this heart of linux is essential because when working in lab environments or simulations this is where you'll mostly find important files like user data or system configurations and apart from that even if you're just using linux yourself knowing how the file system works helps you customize your setup secure your machine, fix issues, and even build custom tools for testing or automation. So let's clear our terminal by typing in the clear command real quick, and then type ls to take a look inside the heart of Linux, aka the root of the file system. Okay so it looks like we've got a bunch of directories here, so let's go through them one by one, starting with this first one right here called bin. Bin stands for binaries, and it basically contains all the commands we've been using so far stored as files. Now you might be wondering, how can commands be stored as files inside a directory, what's going on here? Well you see, almost everything in Linux is a file. From your system's commands to your network settings, to even your computer's input-output devices, everything is represented as a file in Linux, and this basically is a core Linux principle you should always remember. Now if we take a look inside the bin folder here, by first using the cd command, and then typing ls, we'll get a list of all the essential commands used in Linux stored as files. And yes, the ls command we just used, is also itself a file. Now you might be wondering, if ls is a file, then logically we should be able to open it up and see what's inside. Well we can totally do that, and to do that, we're going to use a new command cat. What this command does is it just takes a file, and displays the output on our terminal. So if we type cat followed by ls like this, we'll get something like this displayed on our terminal, which essentially is the command binary, that our computer understands whenever we type the ls command in our terminal. Okay so back to the root of the file system, we just talked about bin, which stores all of our essential commands, but there's also another directory over here called sbin or system bin. Now system bin is just like bin, but it's a bit more special. You see system bin has some special commands, which can only be used by system administrators for managing the system. So if we jump into sbin real quick and then list its contents, you'll see a bunch of commands that only system admins or root users can use. So let's pick one up and actually use it real quick. Let's take this one called add user. Now if you haven't guessed already, what this command does is it will add ourselves a new user. So let's do that real quick by clearing our screen, and then typing add user, and then the name of the user we want to add. But it gave us an error saying only root may add a user to the system, so why is that? Well that's because this command is only meant to be used by administrators, and to act as an administrator in Linux, we type in a command called sudo, before any of our special commands. So sudo, space add user, space test. Now we'll go over what sudo really means later in the video, but for now, just know that we couldn't use the add user command because we didn't have admin privileges, but by using sudo, we can temporarily run that command with administrative rights, so let's give it a try. Also a point to keep in mind is that every time you use the sudo command, you have to type in the password for the user you are currently logged in as, so let's go ahead and type in the password for our main account. And after hitting enter, the add user command will run and will start creating a user. Next, just give the new user you created a password, and skip the rest of the stuff. So we just added a user using the add user command, and these are the type of commands that are located in sbin or the system bin. Now let's get back to root. Okay so now we know that bin has our essential commands, and system bin has our super essential commands. But let's go ahead and explore this other directory called usr, which is short for unix system resources, and it basically contains all the default things that every user on a system can use. So let's type in cd usr, and then type in ls to see what's inside. Okay so you'll notice something interesting here. Inside the usr directory, we also have a bin and an sbin. So what's going on here? Why do we have the same directories in two places? And when we use the ls command, are we using the command stored in root bin, or the usr bin? Well we can actually find that out using the whereas command. This command is used to find out where a specific command on our system actually lives. So let's find out where our ls command actually lives, and as you can see, it is in the usr bin, and not in the root bin. You can ask chat gpt why that is to learn more. Moving on, the usr directory also contains some supporting files like libraries that the command binaries share, and a bunch of other stuff that may come in handy while managing your own system. Anyways going back to root, let's take a quick look at some of these other directories as well. 
Firstly we have boot, which has all the files that our system needs to boot. Bar will have things like log files or server data, and in most controlled testing environments, ethical hackers use it to analyze system performance or identify misconfigurations. TMP or temporary has all the files that go away after our system reboots or something, whereas home is where every user lives on their system. Now if we take a look inside home real quick, you'll notice that we have two homes on our system. One is our home, and the other one is of the user we added earlier. Next, earlier I mentioned that even our computer's input-output devices are also files, and those files are stored here in the DEV directory, which stands for devices. Then we have the ETC directory, also called the Etsy file, which is important for cybersecurity professionals to understand because it contains system configuration files that we'll explore more in the next part of the video. Finally, the MNT and media directories are both used for mounting drives, with media being typically used for automatic mounts, while MNT is used for mounting drives manually using commands. Speaking of commands, before we dive into the next chapter, where we'll break down user management in Linux and explore what the pseudo command really means, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this video Brilliant.org. Being an ethical hacker isn't just about understanding Linux or exploring a few cybersecurity tools, it's also about developing the mindset to solve complex problems while sharpening your logical and analytical skills. Brilliant.org is the go-to platform for building these kinds of thinking patterns, with thousands of hands-on lessons in foundational math, programming, science, data analysis, and AI. One of my favorite Brilliant courses is Thinking in Code, as it walks you through how programmers break down real-world problems into step-by-step -step solutions, and helps you approach coding with both clarity and confidence. Plus if you're someone who struggles to stay consistent with learning, Brilliant makes that part easy too, its daily challenges and bite-sized lessons are perfect for building a habit that sticks, whether you're learning on your laptop, or right from your phone. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, head over to brilliant.org forward slash Annan Alley, or scan the QR code on screen, and get an exclusive 20% discount on Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks for listening, let's get back to the video. Chapter number 3, Linux User Management and the Pseudo Command. Okay so now that we've explored the Linux file system and learned where key components live, let's move on to user management in Linux, because as a cybersecurity professional, understanding how users work is essential for analyzing system roles or privilege levels in Linux. Now the first thing you should know is that whenever you're using the terminal, the user you're logged in is is usually displayed right here, just before the at symbol, but if you ever come across a system where the admin has customized the terminal prompt to hide the username, you can always run the who am I command, to see what user you're currently logged in as. But how do we know how many users exist on a system, is there actually a way to find that. Well yes, and for that, we have to look inside our system's etc directory, that we talked about in the previous chapter. So type in the command with me, cat forward slash etc, and then inside the etc directory, we want to look at a file named passwd. And upon hitting enter, you'll get all the users living on your system. Now you might be wondering, where did all these users come from? I mean the last one we recognize, as it is our main default account, but where did all these other come from? Well you see, Linux systems come with these users by default, and they do serve a purpose, but that's a topic for another video. For now just know that you can't log into a lot of these, as they have a no login entry right next to them. So let's go ahead and create a user account that we can actually log into, and just like the last time, the command is going to be sudo, add user, and then the name of the user we want to add. I'm gonna go with user1 and hit enter. Next, we're gonna put in a password for this user, and then skip the rest of the stuff. And done, our new user account has been created. Now to confirm that it is indeed on our system, let's cat the passwd file once again, and see if our new account is added to the list. And yes, as you can see, it is right there under our main account. Now real quick, what does all this other information mean? I mean the first part we understand, as it is the username of our main account, but what's all this other stuff after it? Well right after the username, we have an X sitting right there all by himself, and it basically indicates that the password of this user is stored on a separate file in the system, called the shadow file, which is also located in the etc directory. Now due to YouTube's policy and general security practices, I won't be showing you how you can access this file, but just know that as a cybersecurity student, it's a critical file to be aware of when protecting or managing a system. But coming back, just after X, we have two similar numbers, so what are these? Well these are the IDs of this specific user account, with the first one being user ID, and the second one being group ID. We'll end up covering what these are in the next part of this video. Next, right after UID and group ID, we have a path given for the home directory of this user, and then just after that, we have the default shell for this user, which by the way if you're not familiar with, I'd highly recommend googling what a shell is in Linux to learn more. Moving on, let me now show you a pretty cool command called user mod, which is used for user modification in Linux. Now there are a ton of things that we can actually modify in a user account, and if you type in dash H for help next to this command, you'll get a list of what those things are. Now I'm not gonna cover everything as that will take forever, but let's quickly go over an example and see how we can modify our user1 account's username. So to do it, we'll type in sudo, as we'll need root permissions for this command, space user mod, space dash L, and then type in a new username that we want to give to our user1 account. Let's go with Ben. 
then, and then, we need to specify the account we want to modify, and upon hitting enter, the specified account will be modified, and so if I cat the pass wd file real quick, you'll see that our user1 account is now Ben. Okay so enough about user management, let's now talk about the sudo command for a second. So first and foremost, you already know that sudo is basically a command which gives us administrative powers, and it stands for super user do, but what if I told you that not everyone can use it? For example the user Ben that we just created, can't use it, and if we log in into Ben real quick using the su command, which basically stands for switch user, and then type in the add user command using sudo, you'll notice an error saying that the user Ben is not in the sudoers file. So what exactly is the sudoers file, and how can we add Ben to it? Well you see, the sudoers file is basically a file that defines who can use the sudo command, and if a user is not within that file, he is basically unable to use the sudo command. Next, let's take a look at one more command related to user management, and then we're done for today. So the command is going to be sudo user delete, which is basically used to remove a user from our system. And so if we wanted to remove the test user we created earlier, we could simply specify their username like this, and hit enter to delete it. Anyway guys so that's it for the video, now while we've covered a lot today, there's still more to learn like exploring how cybersecurity tools are installed on Linux, and the essential networking or file permission commands that every ethical hacker or system admin should be familiar with, so stay tuned for the second part of this video. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comment section down below, and I'll see you in the next one.